Hey friends, it's Becky L. McCoy, and this is Sucker Punched. Hello friends, Uh, welcome to the Burnout series. I, as I was thinking forward to the different emotional experiences that I wanted to share with you. Uh, This was one that like jumped onto the page really fast. (laughs) I feel like uh, I've been learning so much about burnout over the last few years, especially since becoming a single parent. Um, I've realized that I am on the fast track to burnout whenever I'm trying to be the exact kind of parent that I've dreamed of being because uh, I just can't do that as a single parent. Um, and so that's a huge disappointment like we talked about in the last uh, episodes 51 up until this last episode with Leah Joy. And um, and so part of adjusting my expectations for myself as a single parent uh, has been in order to protect myself from burnout because I have really run myself into the ground quite a few times. And it's no service to my children <laughs> to have an incapacitated mom. Uh, so I am learning what that looks like for me. Um, one of the things is I know that I need to travel by myself uh, a few times a year in order that's just really life-giving for me. And it doesn't have to be anywhere incredible. <laughs> it could just be that I'm going to a conference, so I'm going to track tack uh, an extra day or two onto that. Um, but just to have those few days really alone, um, because I am a super introvert, <laughs> that that keeps me going for a little bit longer. Um, also, this podcast has taught me so much about burnout. I have really burned out on it a few times. And um, last year, I took such a big break because I really had to decide if it was something that I wanted to continue doing because... Um, it just wasn't fun or something I looked forward to. Totally burned out. I had zero creativity to give to it. Um, and so I really thought about what are the parts of this project that I love and I don't want to give up and what are the things that are really burning me out. (laughs) Um, and so I realized that there were some of like the back end aspects of the podcast that were really bumming me out and and taking way too much mental energy for me to enjoy the parts that I really enjoy. Um, and so I figured out how to delegate those parts uh, so that I can really focus on the parts that I enjoy, the parts that I'm really good at. Um, and and allow somebody else to take care of the other parts because they are really good at the other parts um, and I don't need to be awesome at everything. That's basically like if I were to write a memoir of like this part of my life, the tagline would be, I don't have to be awesome at everything. <laughs> That's just the mantra that I hear all the time. Um. So those are kind of the the thoughts that I'm bringing into this series and and all the ways that I've learned about protecting myself from burnout and I'm really excited about the different uh, kinds of burnout that we're talking about in this series. Um we're starting with my friend Chantel Runnels and I just really um, pulled the idea of burnout apart. Uh, and that's going to be a two episode, uh, conversation because there was just so much to discuss and it was so, such a good conversation that I couldn't cut any of it out. Um, other conversations, uh, we're going to talk with Darina Lazo Gilmore about burning out as a caregiver and in grief 
um, talk with my friend Amber Salas and burnout and creativity. We're going to talk with Seth Haynes about burnout and social media, having a conversation with um, Trillia Newbell. And ne- uh, the next episode after my two part um, conversation with Chantel is Becky Kaiser. And we're going to talk about burnout in the holidays. Uh, and it's great. <laughs> so if you, um, if you're nervous about the holidays and just how it, it's, you know, if the idea of a holiday season coming makes you like roll your eyes and feel like you have to gear up for it, uh, this episode, that episode with Becky Kaiser is really, um, really encouraging. You don't have to be overwhelmed or feel like the holidays are a rat race. So um, here is my conversation part one with uh, Chantel Runnels. And we're talking about what burnout looks like and feels like and some specific stories of burnout. Uh, And then in the next episode, we'll talk about what it looks like to overcome and break through burnout, how we're learning to avoid and prevent it. Um, And some really, she has so many really great resources. So here is my conversation with Chantel. I am here today with my friend Chantel. And I would like to say that we're real life friends, even though we haven't actually met in real life. But like we just chatted for a real long time before I actually hit the record button. So I'm really glad that you're here. I'm glad to be here. So we're talking about burnout. What, when you think of the word burnout in your life, what does that look like? What does life look like for you when you start to throw that word around a little bit? Ooh, I think there have been phases, but it, it feels like a cloud, like a big, heavy cloud that Mm. just sits on your shoulders and you can't shake it and you can't move it. And it feels like a cloud because a cloud should be something you should be able to blow away or dust off or something. And burnout isn't like that. It feels heavy and it feels hard and sweaty, um, and maybe even a little bit smelly. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. There's definitely like burnout BO, right? Yeah. Yeah. That works. And when I, when I was, yes, burnout BO, uh, that's a good one. I think I'm going to take it. I I think that, um, based on the different seasons of burnout, it's looked differently, right? There's the newborn Mm -hmm. burnout, uh, there's the college burnout, you know, five years yep. senior status. Um, there's the workplace burnout. And then there's the, I am not at all, my life does not look like I thought it would by now. Mm-hmm. now. And so they all yeah, have for a sure. similar feel, like it's almost familiar. It's like, oh, here we go again. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, 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 they still have a unique, a uniqueness to them. Yeah. Can you think if if you just think of a specific time when you felt totally weary and burned out and what did that feel like emotionally and physically? Yeah, I, uh, I'm, you know, I was reflecting on your question and most recently there, I think I've been experiencing a season of burnout and I'm on the other side now. And even that sometimes I don't like using because it's not this mountain that's in the way. I just think there's this transition, almost like a slothing that has to come off, come off of you, you know? So I think most recently for me, that looks like poor self-care, really putting other people above myself, good things, right? But they were taking priority to my sleep, to my wellness, to me even eating. Um, and I love to eat. So that's problematic, <laughs> but it, it just looks like, it just really looks like now I can see in retrospect, 
it's unreasonable. I expect to not sleep, not eat, uh, not exercise or take any kind of retreat, not do things, not play and still produce maximally efficiently Mm. and effectively and be all the places and do all the things with all the people. And that's Mm -hmm. unreasonable. It doesn't make any sense. And so burnout, um, makes me, I think, pessimistic. Um, I find it's hard to be hopeful. Um, I found myself recently just feeling like I wanted to throw in the towel. And if I'd been paying attention, I would have seen that I no longer had the towel (laughs) to throw. I mean, like, bro, bro, now you're all the way done. Right. It's <laughs> you know, gone. The coach has sent yeah. you to the locker room and, you know, I'm there still huffing and puffing and kicking cans or Gatorade bottles on the way, you know, talking about, well, I still can't. And it's like, no, you can't. You're done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go sit down somewhere. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then, I mean, practically short tempered with my kids, um, lending to blame you know, um, other people, even if they're strangers, like, why did this person cut me off? Don't they know I have places to go? Well, they know mm-hmm. nothing about me. And <laughs> right. Of course they really, don't know. Yeah. I mean, they're assuming it cause you're in your car, but yeah. Don't they know I am on the road? Make way now. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it burnout looks at, you know, um, for me it's, oh man, see Becky, now you're going to have me telling on myself, you know, it looks like, those marshmallow bars from Starbucks, they're so tasty. Um, yeah. I think they're called marshmallow dream bars. Yes. Because they are. Yes, they are. <laughs> they are, but in moderation. When you yeah. have them as often as I was having them, it turns into a nightmare because then, you know, I started looking like a marshmallow dream bar. And that's <laughs> how I wanted my life set up. I, you know, so much so that, you know, I can pull up to the Starbucks and they're like, hey, Chantel. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> marshmallow dream <laughs> bar, the usual. <laughs> but I would always kind of get it with a side of venti water to make myself feel better. Um, <laughs> so, so, I mean, so it just impatience and being unreasonable, lending to shame yeah. and blame with others, projecting my feelings on others. And, and, and it's not a happy place to be, you know, it's not a happy place to yeah, be. Yeah, it's not. Well, and we're sitting here giggling at, at how disproportionate the reactions are when you're yes. burned out. But in the moment, y- you have no ability to have any kind of perspective on mm-hmm. the scale of your reaction. Yes. Yes. Because you're just like grasping at anything to grab onto. Anything. You know, it, it, you end up looking like, you know, those people who do those, I don't, they say it's fun. And I I can't see how they do these courses where they go through mud and they, they duck under electric wires and they climb tires and yeah, I have zero desire. (laughs) (laughs) But It kind of looks like that while trying to keep mascara dry. And it's just, everybody can see not working, but me. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, that's always when my mom is like, so have you thought about, <laughs> I'm like, uh-oh, here it comes. <laughs> here it comes. And, you yeah. know, at least you, maybe you said, here it comes to yourself. I, you know, I usually erupt with, of course, of course, I've thought about it. I think about all the things all the time. I have a list of yeah. all the things that I'm thinking about that I can't get to, including right. taking a break, you know, or something like that. Right. Yeah, no, I have not taken a nap because it was not on my schedule to do today. While I'm failing at everything else, I'm thinking about how I'm not taking a nap. (laughs) Babies take naps. I don't take naps. And then (laughs) unhealthy work ethic of, uh, you know, uh, team no sleep, you know, team 4 a.m. Team they sleep, we grind. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. I could use some sleep. (laughs) Yeah. I've never had the no sleep problem. Like even in college, I would be up to like 1230 or one working on a paper. And I just like my brain would actually, I always kind of think of my brain as like, um, like a record player or a CD player, how it spins. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I hit a certain point in the night and it just stops spinning. Like <laughs> there is nothing like you can try and manually, but that's not going to get you much. So yeah. I always have to go to bed and then I would have to wake up super early. But mm. like you were saying before, I really want to be awesome at everything all the time. Yeah. And I, I don't want their, and most of the time I can kind of hack it. But mm-hmm. but I don't want to admit that there's any kind of deficiency and that maybe I'd be better at a few things if I let go of a lot of things. Mm. That's so good. And <sighs> it's true. And, you know, it's unreasonable, Becky. It really is. The fact that we would think we could, um, I don't know, be Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, but there, I think even when I look at my own, the ebb and flow of my own journey so far, part of it is deeply rooted in a desire to do well. Mm -hmm. It's not always this self-fulfilling, um, I want to be great just for the sake of being great. Um, so people will like me. Yeah. Right. (laughs) I genuinely want to be there for people and not disappoint people. And I want to be excellent and, 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 um, be a good steward. And I think that's where, what makes it challenging because it's a lot of good things. Right. Um, but like, you know, I think you're alluding to what are the best things have you read the book Essentialism? Uh, bits and pieces. Greg McKe- McEwen is how you say it, I think, because he's Scottish. Um, I ha- I've had the actual copy of the book sitting on my shelf like since it came out. And I finally listened to the audio book two weeks ago <laughs> <laughs> let's because let's just be real. Audible is my life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, like I had read like bits and pieces and people had summarized it for me, Mm -hmm. but it was just so good. Like he has done the actual studies that say, if you focus on what you do well, then you will do everything better. Yeah. Because you're not trying to compensate. I remember the first time somebody said, said to me, I I can tell you exactly. I was sitting in a chair in a ballroom at a conference, um, just North in Concord, North Carolina. Uh And someone was speaking on strengths finder, which is my absolute favorite strengths finder. Oh, love it. Um, and she said the importance of knowing your strengths is is to recognize and admit that you are never going to be awesome at your weaknesses. And if you spend your whole life trying to improve on your weaknesses, you're neglecting these things that God already made you really good at. Yep. Yep. And I was like, well, if that is not a testament to the last (laughs) 10 years of my life. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, that's the thing. Um, I loved when Strength Finders came out, um, of course, Chris and I being the people we are, we got it right away. And that was at that time, it was, it was a different from everything I had read up to that point, as far as Mm -hmm. self-development and growing as a person, the the sermon had been to work on your weaknesses and you're, you're only as strong as your weakness, so on and so forth, but really embracing, um, our strengths That was, that was new for me. And that, that was a game changer. Oh, absolutely. I'm sitting here thinking about like, wow, ever since I started focusing on my strengths and inviting people into my weaknesses, Mm -hmm. I, Mm -hmm. I don't do like a deep dive into burnout. I still come right. I still dip my toes in, (laughs) (laughs) but it's not like cannonballing in, uh, at the same extent or or on the same like regular it's not like a regular part of my routine because right. I was burning out on the regular. Yeah. Um and you know that just that just reminded me um similar to strength finders when I finally took the enneagram mm-hmm. and learned more about how What number are you? See, this is the thing. Um, I actually tied <laughs> as a one and a three. 
Oh, um, I did too. We can get you? into this. this is yes. Friends. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to go real nerdy, real hard. And <laughs> when I was teaching high school, I'd get like this and my kids would be like, miss nerd rage, calm the nerd rage. <laughs> But I own it and I love it. Um, okay. So with Enneagram, so there's the nine numbers in the circle. And they're 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 all connected in different ways. So when you take a test, you will tie with several numbers or you'll see like every time I took it, I got a one, a three, and a six. Okay. All kind of in the top. Okay. So then... The thing that's so tricky about Enneagram is that it's based on your inner motivation. So a test is a really not accurate way Mm -hmm. to give you a most accurate answer. So then you go through and you start reading um, about, okay, what does a one look like when they're healthy? Yeah. What does, so the one, the three, and the six are actually all in one same group, and I forget what the thing is that ties them together. Um, <laughs> put them in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Oh, yeah. They're, I'll put all sorts of books and things in the show notes. But so like the one wants to be the most responsible person um, and really, really fears being seen as irresponsible. And that is totally me. Like mm-hmm. I am a very classic one. A three is someone who really wants to do well, but because they want to perform well and they want to, to win the awards and they, right. they want, um, they want to be the best. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a six wants to perform well because they are, they are so aware of, the ways that everything can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. They're kind of more on the pessimistic side. So they all have that desire to do well, uh, but for very different reasons. Different reasons, yep. Um, Yep. And then once you kind of figure out, oh, like I think I'm this number, like I'm a one. Well, I realize that when I'm really stressed out, I start to behave like a four. And a four is like, um, fours like to be, like no one else and Mm -hmm. fours get stuck in their minds very often. And that can be a really good thing because they tend to be very, very creative and innovative people. Um, Mm -hmm. But when it's from a place of stress, it's, it shows as you pulling away from other people. Um, But then when I'm healthy, I go towards the seven number, which is the fun Mm -hmm. lover and the one who avoids any kind of pain Um, and like, I had a really crappy day. Let's go get ice cream, you know, like, (laughs) and that's totally me. Um, and, and so you start to see like how all of the different things layer together, um, and why it's not quite as simple as like a spiritual gifting test or a Myers-Briggs test or, um, because a test can't quite figure out like what's underneath. Yes. And why you're yes. doing it. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that I really liked about the Enneagram and, mm-hmm. you know, just recalling this is, um, making me think about how I want to go back and revisit because I haven't revisited some of the, the qualities and, 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 and different thoughts on it. Probably since I realized that, um, I was in a season of burnout slash mm. depression. And, and the Enneagram was helpful for me to understand that even though I felt in some ways I was being productive, the way I was responding was actually typical for a one in a place of depression or anxiety or burnout. Mm -hmm. And so that was an eye opener for me because the reality was most people around me, if not all people around me did not know that I was in a place of depression. Because right. of how a one usually plays that out. And I for sure will swing. So I think I got, I think I tied like one, three, and then somehow got seven and eight. I can't remember. Yeah, that, but I can see that. Yeah, but one definitely felt me, you know, firstborn of four. Mm-hmm. Um, I can see it all throughout my different achievements and places where I was pulled into leadership positions that I didn't even ask to be nominated for. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so it's not like a three where it's like, 
I want to be the Val Victorian or I want to be the class president, you know, right. Or I need to do this. It was like, and Chantel, you're going to be, and I'm like, great. Thanks. I can do that because somebody well, and needs I, to do I this. I think that's <laughs> why focusing on my strengths was mm-hmm. so hard because mm-hmm. it's like, well, but there's nobody there to do the schedule and be the administrator. Right. And even though this isn't like one of my top strengths and it doesn't bring me any joy, somebody has to do it and I'm going to be the responsible one. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, like, and yes. then you start saying yes to everything it, f- just because for the sake of responsibility. It, who will do it? Right. Nobody's volunteering. Nobody's going to lead the group. You know, nobody right. is giving the professor any feedback. Yeah. It, that, mm-hmm. that really resonates with me. And so strength finders and the Enneagram have been both helpful, but most recently the Enneagram was played a significant role in helping me realize that I was, I was depressed. Mm-hmm. Um, and even looking up, Chris and I really like to wordsmith a lot, looking up the word depress. And yeah. really understanding oh, what etymology. Oh, gives yes. me all the happy jingles. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, is really, was really helpful because, um, I can be really cerebral and it was necessary to understand like Chantel, you're under a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. You're literally being pushed down. Um, yes. think of a water bottle and you're crushing it, you know, to let some of the air out, depressing it. Um, mm-hmm. so that was, that was the Enneagram was really helpful in understanding, Hey, like all of this celebrating to go to the nitrogen ice cream place, you know, every single week for a celebration, that's not really a celebration, but then you can kind of like say it is because you're supposed to be celebrating like all of these things. (laughs) It's like, um, you're procrastinating and you're avoiding and you're very stressed and you just want to have fun and be spontaneous. But then when you end up doing that, it actually gives you more anxiety and that makes you more depressed because now you've avoided everything that was on your list. So yeah. Ooh, burnout can be a messy place. Mm-hmm. Messy, messy. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So we've talked about like being in the burnout. Mm-hmm. What ways have you found that you can kind of like claw your way out Yeah. I think the first thing was confession. Mm -hmm. Um, and not necessarily to anybody else, but to myself. So I had a, what we call our household, a Kairos or aha. Um, and for me, my aha was the fact that I need to start confessing things out loud to myself about myself. Mm. So journaling is one thing, but even that isn't as transparent as me saying out loud, this sucks. Yes. Hearing myself say that I don't like the space I'm in has had a different impact than journaling, than even blogging about it or commenting or texting. Something Mm -hmm. about being uh, being able to audibly hear that I am discontent, that I am frustrated, Mm -hmm. that I'm angry, that I'm disappointed was a huge game, game changer. And then, you know, telling Chris, um, I think I might've told one or two other people, I really felt something start to break. And for me, uh, the biggest, the biggest, hmm, or most significant thing that I can do is be physically active. Um, physical activity has always been a key component in my mental health, my spiritual health, everything. It just overflows. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily mean like getting to the gym and working out, but for some time, sometimes for me, it's just being outdoors in nature and just moving. Yeah. So physical activity is huge. And so, um, I just started biking once a week. I said, okay, I know at this time my kids will still be asleep. Um, and maybe somebody will be home. So I'm going to bike as fast as I can, as far as I can for 30 minutes. And when my timer goes off on my watch, I'm biking back. And so that's what I started doing maybe in March Hmm. or April. And that was my only goal. And, uh, once a week I protected that time and I didn't try to make it overly spiritual or planned or focused. The goal was get up, get out of bed, get on the bike. Just move your body. Yeah. 
pedal. And uh, with every stroke of the pedal, it was a revolution. Mm. Um, and that was part of what I think brought me back to life. Yeah. Yeah. For mm-hmm. sure. I think it, it's just so interesting how we're all just wired to need certain things. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and when you, I think sometimes we get, we hear lots of messages like, if you're feeling depressed, do X, Y, and Z. Right. And And it's not necessarily because there's something wrong with us if that doesn't help, but because when we find something that does help, we want to tell everybody and we want everybody to be helped. And we want, you know, we don't want to see people stuck. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true because, you know, um, I used to work in entertainment and even before I did, I love television. I love film. I have a great appreciation for the art that it is, but sitting down and like zoning out even intentionally with Hulu or Netflix does not leave me feeling like, okay, now I can do this. Yeah. You know, it does. But there are people that it totally does. Exactly. Exactly. And so I actually have a greater appreciation for entertainment when I'm in a better place, you Mm -hmm. know, and being spontaneous sometimes can jumpstart me, you know, get digging myself out of the burnout pit. Um, so like a out of town trip, taking the kids to a museum, doing mm-hmm. something out of the ordinary, dropping everything. I think sometimes that's where the, that whole seven wing thing yep. can be a benefit, but nothing has proven, um, as long lasting as, as being physically active for me. Hmm. Like it is, it is so imperative to my mental health and realizing that and saying it out loud and and again, the, and the, the strength of the one in me saying like, okay, like you, you want to be better, like, and you want to want to be better. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so roll out of bed and get on the bike and, uh, yeah, one week at a time until, um, I started giving myself some other goals. And before I knew it, what was this two weeks ago, I did my first official ride and, uh, biked 50 miles, a half century. That's amazing. It was terrible. terrible. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was (laughs) awful. But it's still, but it's still amazing. Like, right? (laughs) It's funny because my one of my spiritual formation people, he said, "Um, I feel like somebody who bikes like the distance of several cities wants to get away." He said, "He was like, fifty miles is not like. Oh, I'm gonna go get some coffee and journal. Fifty miles is like I'm trying to get away by myself." That's awesome. So, I was like, well, you know, to each his own. And cycling yeah. is new for me. I never was a cyclist. Um, but I think with how dense our life has become, yes, it, it really has proven just these long stints, an hour to two hours where I'm not going to get interrupted and yep. I can just really zone out. Mm-hmm. I, it's been magical. Yeah, I bet. Um, so I'm <laughs> sound convinced you should try. I keep trying to get everybody to try it with me. And for some reason, other people don't want to strap themselves onto a bike well, with their shoes and ride for, you know, hours on end. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm not convinced, but I'm also hearkening back to when I ran a half marathon. Ooh, you go. Um, <laughs> That's it I was terrible. Do. It was terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> At the last virtual retreat when Grace was talking about running her marathon, I was like, oh, I feel you. Oh, I got to the end. I mean, okay. So granted, I was, we were all running in memory of my husband. It was uh, eight months after he had died. It was seven months after I'd had a Mm -hmm. C-section. Yeah. So. Oh my Lord. So it was like, it was not just about the half marathon. Like there, there, it was a very like loaded day. Mm -hmm. Um, but it had been a great way to like process my own grief and like kind of keep stress at bay while having a newborn and a two year old and being a widow. And, um, and then I had, uh, panic attacks for the, for seven miles. Oh my. 
Yeah. And so I was like, I'm out. <laughs> like, Please. I don't need this in my life. And my team was like, no, you are not. Like, mm -hmm. God told you to run this race. You are going to run this race. And you are going to get to the wow. end if it kills all of us. Like, we are doing this. And I was like, okay. That's awesome. <laughs> And I was not thinking clearly enough to argue with them. So I just kept going <laughs> and, <laughs> and I crossed the end and my running coach was there and she gave me a big hug and she was like, so how was it? Cause we'd been talking about how so right, many people right. finish a, a big race like that and the endorphins and everything. And they're like, I, I, I didn't really love it, but I want to do it again. Right. And, and yes. I got to the end and I was like, yes. it was horrible. Like I never had a surge of adrenaline. Or maybe I did, and that's what kicked off the panic attacks. <laughs> like, I had the worst kind of surge of adrenaline. Like, it was just, I'm glad that I did it to prove it to myself, but it was terrible, and I'm never going to do right. it again. Yeah. Oh, well, you know. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so that helps, would be my hesitation at the thought of biking 50 miles like mm. uh, <laughs> I, I have my other I have other things can I just say that I am so grateful for Chantel's voice uh, not just in my own personal life, but getting to share her voice with you because she is just so wise and so funny and so awesome. <laughs> um, so join us next week for the conclusion of our conversation. Make sure that you're subscribed to Sucker Punch in order to keep up with us. Uh, that way, it's the easiest way for you to listen to the podcast because new episodes will automatically show up in whichever podcasting app you're using. And also, I would really appreciate it if you would take a minute right now and rate and review Sucker Punched. It's really helpful for new listeners to get a better idea of what they can expect um, which is always helpful. I'm totally a review reader, especially on Amazon, right? Like you're comp comparing two different products and it's really helpful to get the, the opinion of people who have already purchased it. If the quality is right, if it does what it says it does, you know, all that. Uh, and the same goes for podcasts. So please uh, give this podcast five stars and, and leave a review for future listeners. If you are interested in starting a podcast or bringing your own podcast to the next level, definitely check out Resonate Recordings. They are responsible for making this podcast sound great. They help uh, you figure out the production end of things. If, if you want to take things in a new direction, they have so many great resources for equipment and um, getting started and all of that. So I always recommend that people check them out. You can find them at resonaterecordings.com. I would love to hear what is going on with you and your life and um, what, you're, what you're thinking about burnout. So find me on social media at Becky L. McCoy or on my website, Becky L. McCoy. Dot com. I'm really looking forward to continuing my conversation with Chantal next week. So I look forward to chatting with you all then. Bye.